there's this beautiful poem. It's in the book of Isaiah. The city of Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Babylon, a great kingdom in the north. And all of these Jewish people, they've been sent away into exile, but a few remained in the city. And they're left wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls. And far out on the hills we see a messenger, and he's running towards the city. He's running and he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet? Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? That despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. So when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, they mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, a powerful, successful kingdom. It needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies and forgiving them and seeking peace. This is an upside-down kingdom. Now, Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah, so for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high-ranking Roman officer, and he comes to Jesus begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people, forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him killed. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right. But for Jesus, this is what had to happen. Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people Israel as just one small part of the entire human condition. How all humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. So how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies. This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto a throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king, that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. Thanks for watching this Okay, um, if you are a child, fifth grade on down, um, you're welcome to head downstairs.
Uh, I'll give you that video for free. You can watch that with the adults. Now you need to, you can go. You don't have to go. You can go. Uh, or you can stay up here and listen to me. But there's, there's more age-appropriate messaging downstairs for you that's been prepared by a wonderful group of volunteers. Um, so feel free to head down that way if you'd like. Um, okay. So here's, uh, I'll get a couple things um, out of the way, and uh, Yong, you can put that first slide up. Uh, here's a, the, the question we're going to ask, but, but before, before I talk about this, I want to get two things out of the way. One is, I'm not a theologian, I'm a philosopher. Um, the other is, I'm not a pastor, I'm a teacher. Okay, so uh, today's sermon might be a little bit different than the, than the normal sermon, um, pitched from a, a slightly different direction. Um, I'm going to speak kind of from my experience and my, uh, give you kind of my perspective on how I view uh, some of what we're talking about today. Um, but I want to ask this question. Uh, there's a couple things going on even on this main slide. We're going to ask a question about, is the gospel good? Um, I suspect, um, if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, um, you might think that there's a clear and obvious answer to that question uh, of course the gospel is good, right? Like, it literally means the good news, doesn't it? Like, so of course the gospel is good. Um, here's something I want to say uh, that I say to my students uh, when they, when they sub- turn in papers where I have them write essays. A lot of times my, my students will say things like, well, obviously this argument is crazy, or clearly this is the case. And I say, well, if it's obvious and it's clear, then there shouldn't be any disagreement about it, right? Everybody should just be on board. If it really is obvious and clear, everybody should agree. Yet, we've got this, you know, philosophical disagreement that you're writing about. So obviously, these professional philosophers don't think it's obvious and clear, right? Uh, Well, so too with this message. Look around the world. I mean, here's a couple of examples. I mean, there's all kinds of worldviews out there, right? Uh, Not all these people in this image are Christians who endorse the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Um, a lot of people, um, you, there, there might be a lot of people who have simply never heard the gospel, right? Um, so, of course, they wouldn't think that the gospel is good. They would, they would know what to think of it. A lot of people have heard the gospel, though. A lot of people know a lot of Christians. A lot of people grew up in church, right? They've heard the gospel time and time again growing up. And they look at it and they say, my considered opinion is that I don't really see what's all that great about the gospel. It doesn't seem that great to me. It doesn't seem that good to me. Um, so there's, there's that. Here's the other thing I tell my students. Explain your answer. Uh, this, is the, this is the part. I don't want us just to say, yes, the gospel is good. That's the easy part, right? Um, I want us to be able to explain to people what is good about the gospel, right? So that's what I want us to think about today. What is it exactly that's good about the gospel? Uh, I'll give you partial credit if you say, yes, the gospel is good. You'll get full credit, though, if you can explain your answer on the, on the assignment. Okay. All right. So, uh, Yong, you can go to the next slide. Um, so here's the passage. Uh, it's kind of small up there. I put the whole, whole thing on there. This is what we read together in the, the congregational reading. Um, Isaiah 52. Um, here what we see, uh, the, the watchmen are shouting for joy. Um, the good news of peace and salvation. The news that God, the God of Israel reigns. Uh, this passage says very clearly that, there, that there's good news coming, right? This passage is interesting um, because it's, it's placed in this context where Israel as a nation uh, is in exile. It's, it's in shambles. Israel maybe isn't a nation, if, if you want to talk about it that way. Um, it also comes right before one of the very famous sort of like suffering servant passages in Isaiah, uh, where, where God says, it's not just that there's good news coming, some, some great king, but really there's this suffering servant. It's this passage where it talks about um, he's so disfigured that you wouldn't even recognize that he's a man, right? And so, of course, that, that for us today, that brings up images of the cross, right? And, and uh, Christ as the suffering servant on the cross. Um, we'll, come, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this passage a little bit more in context um, as we go here. Okay, next slide. Um, okay, so here's, the, here's what I want to start with. Is the gospel good? Here's the question I'm not asking, but, but a question that a lot of people could ask. Um, is the gospel true? Um, that's like a, like you might think of it as like apologetics kind of question, like defending your faith, right? Um, and uh, what got me interested in this is the gospel good question um, was I was listening to a podcast with uh, many of you may have heard of Josh McDowell. Um, I think, uh, what's the book that he wrote? Is it Evidence That Demands a Verdict? I think is one of the books he wrote. Uh, and then he's got a son now who's also uh, a philosopher, apologist. 
um, named Sean McDowell. I was listening to a podcast of, of Sean McDowell's podcast, and he was interviewing his father, Josh McDowell, asking sort of like, what's changed over the years, you know, like 50 years worth of ministry or something for Josh McDowell. And one thing that, that Josh McDowell said was uh, a question people used to ask was, is the gospel true? Um, today, what a lot of people ask is, is the gospel good? Um, and what they mean by that is, regardless of whether Christ raised from the dead, is it the sort of thing I really want to give my life to? Like, do I, do I really care to sacrifice everything that's important to me, to live my life in the way that Christ says I should live it? Uh, what's so great about that? Maybe I have a whole, a whole set of moral beliefs that I already hold pretty dear. Um, and, you know, push somebody on their moral beliefs sometimes. Like, your moral beliefs are the ones that you probably hold most closely to your identity. Like, when you think something's wrong, uh, you probably, like, you're probably really convinced of that. You don't like being pushed too much on it. Uh, but a lot of people maybe have preconceived moral view of the world, right? Where, uh, you know, Jesus tells us to live quite differently. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, than what you know, kind of that, that view is. So it's not, this is not the kind of thing I would want to give my life to. Um, that's the distinction between these two questions. One thing I want to say, and I'll, I'll say this briefly, uh, is that I don't think this question is unimportant. In fact, I think this question, the, the, the true question, the, part, the question about is the gospel true, I think that's critically important. Um, and if you are sitting there thinking, if you think about apologetics and the kinds of arguments people give for the existence of God or evidence for the empty tomb and the resurrection of Christ, that kind of thing, if you're sitting here thinking, I, you know, that's, I'm glad there's people out there that think about that, but it's not really important to me. I don't really care about that. It's not my cup of tea. I'm not that kind of intellectual, academic thinking kind of person. Um, let me suggest to you in two different ways why I think that's a bad thought to have. You shouldn't be having that thought. Um, I'll give you a secular defense of, the, of this, of my claim here, that, that you should take this question seriously, and then I'll give you a, a biblical argument for it. Here's the secular defense of why you should think this question's important. If you're going to build a worldview on Christianity, if Christianity is like your worldview, it's the lens through which you view everything, right? How you live, why, why do you think we're here at all? What in the world is the universe? Where are we going? What's the point of all of this? How should I treat other people? Where does value and meaning come from? Those are the kinds of questions that a worldview is supposed to address. Right? Uh, so if you have a worldview that's based on a historical event, like Christianity is. Christianity is based on a lot of historical events, but especially one in particular. There was a, a Sunday morning, right, where there was this empty tomb. Right? A specific historical event. If you think that if you're going to build an entire worldview on that, don't you think it would be nice if you had a little bit of evidence to support it, right? Shouldn't you have some reason to think what you think about, about your worldview? Shouldn't there be some basis in it? There's a famous view um, defended by some philosophers up at the University of Rochester, where I study philosophy, um, called evidentialism. And this view is actually pretty simple it's, it, 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 and when you say it, a lot of commonsensical. You should only believe what your evidence supports. Don't believe things if you have no reason to believe it. That's this view called evidentialism. Uh, I submit to you that there's a secular reason for why if you base your worldview on Christianity, you should think this question, is the gospel true? Like, it, that's, that should be an important question. Let me give you a religious defense, too, though, quickly before I move on. Yong, you can go to the next slide. Here's a passage. I'm not going to read this entire passage. You've probably heard it before. Um, I think this is probably like the second favorite verse of anyone who calls themselves like an apologist who talks about apologetics. The first, what would you say the first verse you would expect to hear an apologist talk about if, they, if you were saying, here's why it's important to think about whether your faith is true or not. What verse comes to mind? Anybody? Anybody think of one? What's that? John 3.16? Okay, that's not the one I'm thinking of. Here's the one I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of always be prepared to give a reason for why you believe, right? That's like the perfect verse to set up a talk. Now let's talk about why you need to be an apologist, right? Or you need to think carefully about apologetics. I think this is the second favorite verse. Uh, and I say that because it says, that, and if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. It goes on to talk about this. Specifically, this is Paul saying, if, Christ, if that tomb wasn't empty, and not because someone stole the body, but because Christ really rose from the dead, 
then all, all that you believe about your worldview is utterly worthless. And at the end it says you're to be pitied. Here's some things that if you read through this passage that, that would be worthless. It says Christ's resurrection, obviously would be, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, Christ's resurrection doesn't exist. What does that mean? That means for our concept of justice, um, that's, like, that's, the, that's the linchpin, right? Is that in order for, you know, God has to judge sin, has to judge evil. And most people think that there's something right about that. The Adolf Hitlers of the world need to be judged. Like something, like they, they've done bad things and they need, there needs to be some punishment for that, right? Um, if Christ doesn't, you know, it doesn't die on the cross, then I don't know, that judgment maybe goes to you, right? Uh, but certainly Christ hasn't, hasn't satisfied God's justice. Um, the testimony of the apostles is worthless here. Uh, think about What's, what's one important role that the testimony of the apostles has? Well, all of our New Testament, essentially, is the testimony of the apostles, right? If it turns out Christ isn't raised from the dead, they're liars, right? And none of this is worth, any, worth our time, right? It goes on. I mean, forgiveness is going to be a sham, right? God, God can't, God, the, our message, right, is that forgiveness comes through the cross, right? Because justice has been satisfied, God can offer grace and mercy. Um, Think about things you believe about sort of where we come from, where, we, where we're going. What do you say when a dear Christian friend passes away? What do you say to comfort yourself? Anybody? What do we say? Yeah, they're, it's in, they're in a better place, right? Like, they're, they're, not, they're not suffering anymore, right? They're with the Lord, right? We really, do you really think that? Is that a comforting thought for you? Well, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, then that's gone as well. What do you think about your own suffering in your own life? Uh, you might think this is temporary and fleeting, right? Eventually I'm going to be with those friends, right? In heaven with God and, and, and all my worries will be, will be gone, right? Uh, again, that's worthless if the gospel isn't true. Um, okay, so that's, that's my point to say I really actually think the question about is the gospel true is critically important. And it's not only important for us presenting the gospel to other people outside of the church. I think it's critically important for you sitting in these pews right now because I'm 100% confident that every single one of you has had a doubt or a thought about, um, is this really true? Is this really worth giving my life to? Um, and if you're sitting there in the pew constantly telling yourself, I'm having these doubts, I shouldn't have these doubts, push these doubts away, stop thinking about it, uh, it's not going to go well for you. It's, it's just not. You're going to live your entire life with this some kind of like cognitive dissonance about, the things you do at church versus the things you actually think in your head. Um, so if you're having questions about the truth of the gospel, uh, I, I, I encourage you to pick one of the questions you have, one of the doubts you have, and find an answer to it. Pursue it. Dig in. Really ask deep and honest questions about it. And when you do it, don't do it in this sense. Like, let me just go find, find an argument that supports what I already believe. But really ask yourself the question, well, is, is the resurrection of Christ really the best explanation for the evidence that we have surrounding the empty tomb, right? And be open to the fact that there's arguments on both sides. There's evidence on both sides, right? Um, and there's intelligent, well-reasoned people who disagree about those questions, but dig into it. Otherwise, I think your faith is really going to suffer. Um, if you want to know more about it, come talk to me about it. I love talking about those things. So um, I think it's really important. Okay. Young, you can go back to the next slide. You can go one more. And then, uh, sorry, it should, have, it should have had a thing on there. Go back to the other one. Maybe it's not. There we go. That's good. Okay. Um, so we get this question, is the gospel good? Um, and the first question, I think you can hit one more. There should be something. There we go. Okay. Um, here's what I want to say. There's different ways we can talk about whether the gospel is good. The first thing we need to do is sort of understand what the gospel is. This is hopefully what that video at the beginning will sort of help us think about, right? Um, and the short answer is going to be that the gospel is the announcement of a coming kingdom, the coming kingdom of heaven on earth. The kingdom of heaven is near. This is how Matthew sets up Jesus Christ beginning his ministry um, in, in Matthew chapter 4, um, announcing the coming of a kingdom, right? The kingdom of heaven. Um, so there's a couple ways we can talk about defining the gospel, understanding what the gospel is. One is by saying the gospel is, and then fill in the blank. There's another way you can define things, which is like a negative definition, which is the gospel is not these things. Um, if, you, if you're ever interested in this sort of pattern, you can read my dissertation in philosophy at, uh, up at U of R, 
Uh, but the whole, the, whole, the whole dissertation is about this view called physicalism. And what is physicalism? And one response to that question is by saying, well, physicalism it means everything that exists is not mental or like dualist, like souls, those kinds of things. So one way of defining it is like saying what it's not. It's not those things. Everything is physical, but it's, it means it's not those things, right? Uh, you, trust me, you don't want to read that dissertation. <laughs> but uh, nobody, even philosophers don't read other philosophers' dissertations. We wait, we wait a couple years till they publish some journal article that was inspired by the dissertation, and then we go from there. But um, Okay. Um, all right, so let's go to the next slide. Here's where it all starts for Jesus, and at the, the beginning of Matthew, Matthew 4.17. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So the, the, the video talked about this. Um, the gospel is an announcement of a coming kingdom, kingdom of heaven on earth. Uh, and that kingdom is near. Christ is, throughout the book of Matthew, through the other gospels, of course, going to present himself as king, right? And so uh, if you want to have a kingdom, you've got to have a king, right? Um, and then we want, what we want to know, too, is what's it going to look like to live under that king's reign, right? Um, we don't have to wonder too hard about that question in the book of Matthew because immediately following this, Jesus is going to go call a couple disciples, the fishermen, uh, and then we get three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, where Jesus lays out in painstaking detail exactly what it looks like to live under the rule of the king of the kingdom of heaven, of your Christ. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but here's, here's one thing I want us to um, think about. Okay, so let's, let's look at a little bit of history. So, Yong, you can go to the next slide. Let's start here. Let's think about the kingdom of heaven. Um, we've got the garden. This is the first time in Scripture that the idea of ruling and reigning is mentioned. And it's not, interestingly enough, in specific reference to God, but actually it's in reference to us, right? God creates us so that we can reign. Um, he says this in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish of the, in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So God begins establishing a kingdom here on earth. And what's interesting about it is that he wants you to be a part of that, right? He wants us, human beings, to rule with him, right, here on earth. Uh, here's the, the spoiler alert. So here's, if you're... If you're a, a reader of the Old Testament, let me give you a strategy for reading it. Anytime you see God sort of like setting up a kingdom, sort of getting things just right, getting people in line, making sure everything's set up, everyone's set up for success, you should have a, like a, you should start grimacing, right? Because if you read the next few chapters, it's going to go poorly, right? It's just, it's just not going to go well after that, right? Um, and so this is what we could do after we see this nice setup in Genesis chapter chapter 1 and through Genesis chapter 2. This is great. Uh, paradise on earth, literally, right? Um, what happens next? Genesis chapter 3, right? They take the fruit from the tree. They sin. They, what they do is they look at the reign of God and they say, essentially, that's not good enough. It doesn't seem good to me. Um, maybe I have a, a different conception of what seems good. And we pursue it, right? Um, Fast forward a little bit more. God will, God will start, God reacts to, the, to the, the, the problems that go on in early Genesis. Eventually he selects a particular group of people to begin building his kingdom through again, right? He selects, he pulls Abraham out of you know, the people of the earth, right? And sets, sets him aside, sets his descendants aside as heirs to this promise that salvation will come, you know, through these, these people, right? Um, it continues going uh, poorly. Eventually you end up with the nation of Israel living as slaves in Egypt shortly, right? Okay, so we get to this next passage, Exodus and the Red Sea. This is an interesting passage because after the Israelites passed through the Red Sea, this is the first time anyone in the Bible refers to God as king, 
Um, and what we get is this passage here that comes from Exodus. This is parts of Exodus chapter 15. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He has hurled horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. Skipping ahead to the end of that chapter. You will bring them in, talking about the people of Israel, bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, that your hands have established. And then this phrase, the Lord will reign forever and ever. The Lord as king, right, presented there. Um, think about what this is, this is following, right? Following ten plagues, God delivering his people out of Egypt. He didn't do it through might of military strength, right? He did it through ten plagues. He did it through a pillar of fire. He did it with Moses and Aaron. He did it with the waters of the Red Sea, right? And so they've come through this time, and they said very, very uh, exuberantly say, God is the king. He's going to reign forever and ever. This is awesome. Let's go. Remember my strategy I gave you a minute ago for reading the Old Testament. When everything seems perfect, start grimacing, right? Because it's about to go downhill. Um, and, of course, what happens here? Well, Moses says, hey, before we go to the promised land, let me make a quick pit stop here at this mountain. I'm going to talk with God for a second, figure out kind of how this whole thing's going to work. And what do the Israelites do after five minutes of Moses being away? The golden calf, right? Um, and Aaron himself is instrumental in that process, right? Um, and so you get the golden calf. Um, you get people eventually, we go, we go and we ask, um, you know, what, can we go into the, the promised land now? We're ready to go into the, we get past the golden calf. Um, God's going to give us this land. Let's send some scouts ahead, figure out what it's like. They come back and they say, oh, this is great. Look at all these grapes we found. It takes like two men to hold like this bunch of grapes that they found. This is awesome. Um, all right, well, let's go then, right? They say, well, no, 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 wait. Those, like, their cities have like walls and like armies and their soldiers are kind of big, bigger than us. So I don't think we can do it. I don't, th- I don't, think, we can, I don't think we can take the land. And so you know, Caleb there you know, famously says, you know, we should, but the rest of the spies say, let's not do it, right? Uh, I don't know how that happens uh, from our perspective, at least, thinking about what just happened in Egypt and coming out of Egypt through the Red Sea, right? Uh, I don't know how well, it's a few cities with walls and a few big warriors is all of a sudden like an insurmountable obstacle, but I suspect we probably all reason this way sometimes, right? We come through amazing challenges in our own lives in the past only to be flummoxed when we see the next one, right? And, and we quickly, it, it be very easily, we can be moved to doubt God and God's deliverance for us. Um, okay, so we've got this history. We get to Isaiah in the exile. Israel's in shambles, right? It's, we've gone through this cycle many, many times by now. If you read through the Old Testament, God's setting up a kingdom, it's falling apart, setting up a kingdom. Now, in the background here is the fact that God knew that all of these things were going to be unsuccessful, right? It's not like God was pinning his hopes on Adam and Eve not taking the fruit from the tree, right? Like God, God knew what was transpiring. The ultimate plan here is Christ, right? And that's what we get in Isaiah. We see a kingdom in exile, kingdom in shambles. We're imagining a watchman standing on the walls of Jerusalem, the great city of God, right? The city through which God is going to do his great work in the world, right? And it is in shambles, right? The the ten northern tribes have been obliterated and scattered to the wind, never to return, right? The southern tribes have been conquered, sent into exile, right? What about all that, all those promises? What about that God reigning as king forever, right? That's the, that's the challenge that, that we see in Isaiah, that, that's facing Israel as a nation, right? Um, and that's why we see when the messenger comes with good news that God reigns, the God of Israel still reigns, is such potentially powerful news for someone living in that, in that world. So let's fast forward a little bit to uh, Christ. So let me see. Yeah, go to the next slide. Christ kicks off his ministry by saying, prepare the way of the Lord's coming. Uh, sorry, this is John the Baptist <laughs> preparing the way. Clear the road for him. And then Christ comes in and says, repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Um, this is a potentially, so I want to say this. And so thinking from the perspective of someone who's not already on board with the gospel message, thinking about whether the gospel is good, um, hearing people talk about making the kingdom of God come down to earth and setting up some 
godly kingdom here on earth um, probably can be a kind of a scary phrase for a lot of people, right? Um, and the reason why is uh, I have a quote here um, from Pope Urban II. This was in 1095 before the first crusade. It says something like this. Let this be your war cry in combat, because this word is given to you by God. When an armed attack is made upon the enemy, let this one cry be raised by all the soldiers of God. It is the will of God. It is the will of God. Whoever shall determine upon this holy pilgrimage and shall make his vow to God to that, to that effect and shall offer himself to him as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, shall wear the sign of the cross of the Lord on his forehead or on his breast. And after this time, the first crusade captured the city of Jerusalem and basically just slaughtered everybody. Right. So for a lot of people, they hear things like that. When we start talking about the coming kingdom of heaven, they start hearing things like that, right? What was the church motivated by? What was Pope Urban II motivated by? In part, it was that the holy places had been taken from us, and we had to get them back sort of at all costs, right? Uh, and it was worth any cost, any cost, right? So that's a, that's a scary thing. We could talk about modern examples of this, right? Uh, from not just Christianity, but from other religions as well. It's setting up a kingdom of God here on earth, and it can also often be scary. So, so what does that look like? What does it look like for Christ? Um, go to the next slide, Yong. Okay. Here we get a passage. So I told you we don't have to wonder too much about what it's like to live under the kingdom of Christ. And here's one thing I want to say. Here's one way that I think we can demonstrate the goodness of the gospel to people. Because here's a passage of scripture, but I think it's a passage of scripture that resonates with just about anybody who wants to take the time to think about it carefully. And that's this. So we say, you have heard that the law says that the punishment much ma must match the injury. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So here, pause. This is Jesus going through this section on the law and the prophets saying, I'm not abolishing the law and the prophets. I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to do away with that. I'm here to fulfill it. And then every time he mentions the law or the prophets, he adds something to it. Um, so this is a really interesting, I think, demonstration of Christ understanding his role not just as a member of the kingdom of heaven, but as the king of the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, here's, here's the things you've heard from your rabbis and your religious teachers. Let me give you more, let me better, and, and improve this for you. I can, so putting his teaching right alongside the, the sort of cultural teachings of, of, the, religious, of the Jewish faith. Uh, and so we get this picture. Notice that this gives an Israelite a right to a certain kind of recompense, right, or vengeance. Right? Like if someone has harmed you, you have the right to harm them back. And in, the, in the same way, in the appropriate degree, not just to do whatever you want willy-nilly, but, but you have a right to do that. Uh, notice what Jesus says, though. He doesn't say, well, it's your right, so take a hold of it, right? Take a hold of it. No, what he says is, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry the, his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. This is just one of many passages. In, uh, immediately after Christ says this kingdom is coming, here I am, the king. Uh, immediately after he says that, there's three chapters of this kind of stuff that describes that this doesn't look like the kinds of things Pope Urban II was talking about a minute ago, right? This looks very different from that. Uh, it's radical teaching, really. Um, and uh, go back, you can go back to the previous slide. Uh, okay, so in this passage, I was listening to a sermon recently by Tim Mackey. He's the, the guy, one of the guys that does the Bible Project video, the video that we just saw. Uh, and he was talking us through, he was saying, when you read this passage, slapping you on the one cheek and, and not turning him the other. What you're supposed to imagine is something like this. Imagine you're a fisherman in, in Judea, and you're, you've just caught your fish for the day, and as you're headed back to town, you've got to pass through the, the tax booth, um, and you don't have the money to pay taxes on the, the catch that you got for that day. Um, so you, you essentially, you're just going to have to get rid of some of the fish, right? Because um, you can't pay the tax. You can't afford the tax. Uh, but suppose you tell that tax keeper, I, can't, I don't have the money. I can't, can't pay the tax. The kind of thing you would exp that would happen is that tax collector might jump up on the table and just unleash a smack right across your face, just humiliating you in front of everybody, right? 
because you've, you've sort of failed in your duty as a good, maybe a good Roman citizen here, right? Uh, utterly embarrassed you. What, is, what, what should your posture as a member of the kingdom of heaven be? And this is maybe one of the most challenging things Jesus ever says, right? Is your posture shouldn't, you shouldn't be concerned at all about your pride, shouldn't be concerned at all about your standing, you shouldn't be concerned at all about how unjust what they just did to you was, you shouldn't be concerned about what your technical, like, legal, moral rights are in this case. About, you know, I mean, I should be able to slap this guy back on the cheek since he just slapped me on the cheek. He says, what you should do is you should look at that person. You should feel compassion for that person. You, you say something like this. If you're struggling, you know, maybe you've had a bad day. Do you need to get any more out? Turn this other cheek. Here I am. This is, and, and Tim Mackey talks about it as, it's stronger than just, like, being a doormat. Being a doormat is, means you're just like passive when someone harms you. You do nothing in response. This is much stronger than that. This is actually turning around and being compassionate in the face of deep injustices, right? Thinking, thinking about that person critically um, and caring for that person. Um, says the same thing for um, these other passages. The soldier asks you to carry their gear, uh, which, which is something that could happen quite regularly. You say, you know, listen... I'll carry this all the way to your front doorstep for you if you want. Would that, make you, would that make it better for you? Would that help you? Let me serve you. That's the kind of response, that's the kind of ethic that Christ endorses. And I think it's beautiful. I think it's really challenging, but really beautiful. Um, okay, let's go, let's skip ahead. A uh, couple slides, Yong. Go one more. Okay, okay. I just told you how beautiful the gospel is, right? Let me, let me pull this together here in a couple minutes. Um, why doesn't everybody get it? Why, why doesn't that appeal to everybody? Um, I think there's maybe several reasons why that is, um, but let's talk through a couple of these. Um, go to the next slide, Yong. Okay. One more. I think there should be, okay, there we go. So one reason why someone might not recognize that the gospel is good is because we can start thinking about the what the gospel is not views. So what are people hearing when they think about the gospel? One thing the gospel is not is the gospel is not a political view, right? But think about Christianity, let's so say, in America here. That's a, what we're most familiar with. Think about what, what, what reputation does a white evangelical church in America have right now? When you, when you say, I go to a white evangelical church, my suspicion is the first things that start popping into people's minds are that you voted for Trump, you're very conservative, you're probably pro-life, um, you might be anti-immigration, you might be, you know, we could fill out this list of political views that are attached to your being an evangelical, right? Um, why is that the case? I don't think it's all because the world has just foisted that on us, right? I think a lot of us think things like this. There's this view called Christian nationalism, which is a view that, like, a very strong view about America's role in God's great plan of salvation. Um, a lot of us think, or might think, um, like, America is critical for God's plan of salvation on earth. Like, we play, we're a Christian nation. Um, the things that we do, the work that we accomplish is good. God sort of, like, needs us. Isn't, he, isn't it lucky that God's got the United States on his side in order to accomplish his work, right? The founding fathers were Christians. There's a Christian nation through and through. Everything about America is Christian. And our, notice how quickly like, your, your politics and your faith become this one thing, right? Yeah, then, I mean, but then look at these, these other facts, right? Take um, a, a distinction. A pretty, there's a pretty strong distinction between the way black Christians and white Christians vote, right? So we've got very different black Christians historically have voted mostly Democrat, mostly liberal. White, cons white, white evangelicals have mostly voted Republican and conservative, right? Why is there such a disconnect here? Is it because, like, one of those sides is stupid? Is it because they're, nobody's, you know, nobody on the one side has thought about it before? No, it's because th there's all kinds of room for reasonable disagreement in politics, right? And the, thinking about what should a Christian be like, politically speaking, there's a, there's a whole lot of debate we can have, right, about those different views. Uh, and so I think one reason people think is the gospel might not be that great is because they think the gospel just is this kind of like political view. 
So I think one important step we can take is to make sure that our politics and our faith are clearly delineated from one another, right? Uh, take strong stands on the core things that matter, the, 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 the fundamentals of your faith, right? Uh, be much more open with that, that other stuff, right? Whatever it may be. Um, okay, another, Yong, the next one. The gospel is not just another worldview. Okay. What does it mean that the gospel is not just another worldview? I mean this. A lot of people might think Christianity is great. If that's, what you're, if that's, your, if that's your cup of tea, great. Um, but there's so many different worldviews you can have, and they're all equally good or bad or neutral or whatever. Uh, it's just the case. Um, let me contrast this quickly with, with one. Let me give you one comparison to show how you can kind of think through this. Um, I don't think Christianity is just another worldview. I think it's the best worldview. Um, and I don't say that just because I grew up in a church. I say that because uh, when I think about the things the, the, our worldview has to offer, I think they're just better than the things that some other worldviews have to offer. So contrast Christianity with naturalism. Think about the questions that we want a worldview to answer. Where did we come from? How should we treat other people? What's the meaning of all of this? Where are we going? Those kinds of questions. Um, on a naturalistic worldview, you're going to get these kinds of answers. Uh, we're here by accident. Um, things that are here by accident um, don't straightforwardly have much value to them, don't straightforwardly have much meaning or purpose to them. Maybe a kind of subjective meaning that, you know, you can like, you can imagine that your life is valuable, but, it, but it's just, not, that's all it is. It's your, you think your life is valuable or something like that. Um, I'm inclined to think that morality is stronger than that. Um, when I look at examples of immoral things that go on in the world, right, when I think about the Adolf Hitlers of the world, I think it wasn't, it's not just that I think Hitler was mistreating people because, like, they just, it seems to me like people are valuable and he shouldn't have done that. Um, that's a strange, that to me, stra that's a, an implausible view of morality. A more, much more plausible view is that those people really are valuable. They really are worth being treated, they, they, they ought to be treated a certain way, and what was being done really was wrong. So one thing you can think is, which worldview gives you the most plausible answers to that? Well, Christianity has plausible answers to that, I think, because we're intentionally created. We're here for a purpose. I told you about it. We're here to reign with Christ on earth, right? You're valuable because you're made in the image of God. God is good. Um, you deserve to be treated a certain way. Christianity can, can provide those answers. So it's a, it's a kind of argument that says, listen, think about your most deeply held beliefs about the way the world is. Which worldview gives you the best explanation for why the world is that way? Um, and I think if you have a sort of like a deep, deep sort of view of morality in that sense, um, I think some of these other worldviews are going to struggle to give you those answers. Um, okay. Yang, you can put the last two up there, and I'll just say this quickly in closing. Um, the gospel is not just replacing all the things you already believe. Let me say this. So someone might say, I don't want to be a Christian because Christians believe things that I don't think are moral or I don't think are right. Um, remember, this is a worldview, right? This is a worldview that's supposed to tell you about how the world is, how you ought to live in the world, is one of the questions a worldview is supposed to answer. It would be really strange if you went to, like, a moral teacher and that moral teacher never taught you anything. They just always told you exactly what you already believed to begin with, right? Um, if my mathematics teachers throughout my schooling career had only ever taught me what I already believed, I wouldn't know much. I mean, I don't know much math anyway, I guess. But I, don't, I wouldn't know much, right? Like, if you just keep repeating to me what I already know. Um, it seems like part of a moral education is that you're going to learn things you never thought before. You're going to be challenged to improve. You're better you know, when you're an advanced student of morality than when you were a beginning student of morality. You can make better choices, better decisions. So your worldview ought to push you to change, I think. That seems like a common sense sort of view. So if someone looks at our worldview and says, it's just different than what I already believe, well, I, I've, I've suggested to them that might be a reason to prefer it, right? <laughs> because because it, it does say something different. Why would you think that you would just naturally have all the right moral views about everything? That, that would be sort of strange, right? And then the last one, it's not innate. Here's the, here's the point that I want to leave you with and I want you to think about. People don't know the gospel sometimes because they don't see how it's really been good for you. Right? What has the gospel done for you in your life? 
Um, think about that answer. Like, really? Has the gospel been good to you? Has it affected your life in ways that matter? Ways that are relevant? If it hasn't, then I don't know why you're sitting here, right? But if there are real, real ways in which the gospel has tangibly affected your life, tangibly changed how you view things, how you get through life, um, I think people need to hear that, right? And they need to hear it from you. And they don't need to hear some abstract theological reason, like the gospel's good because Christ was the propitiation for my sins. Blah, blah, blah. Get rid of all that, right? What they need to hear is like the gospel is good for me because there was this time in my life where fill in the blank, right? That's how the gospel matters to me. Um, and I think that's something we probably don't think nearly enough about. Uh, we probably don't talk nearly enough about. I know I don't think or talk nearly enough about it. Um, but the gospel is a, such a beautiful picture. Go, going back to that Matthew passage, right? Where we're called to, to serve. We're called to love in the face of injustice. We're called to love our enemies. Um, that's such a beautiful picture that has so much potential to really affect the world that we live in, really change the way we interact with people and they interact with us. And I think we should talk more about it. So as the worship team comes up, let me say a word of prayer. And my, my main suggestion to you uh, as you go throughout this week is to start thinking about how has the gospel affected me? For real, actually affected me. If you haven't accepted the gospel, that doesn't mean anything to you. If you want to hear about how the gospel has affected me, come talk to me. If you want to hear about how it's affected Mike, come talk to Mike, right? Uh, come talk to anybody about the gospel. And I think we could tell you probably beautiful stories about it. Uh, and I think it's a worldview that's worth considering, worth devoting someone, uh, someone's life to. Um, I think it's that important. Um, that's, that's, that's my perspective, partially built on experience. So uh, let me say a word of prayer as the worship team comes up. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, this chance to reflect on your word, to think about um, the role that the gospel plays in our life, has played in the lives of, of others. Lord, help us to understand uh, how your love um, matters in this world today, Lord. Um, not just for the sake of telling others, though that's an important part of it, but also for, for the sake of, of quieting our own hearts as we think about uh, the own struggles that we have, Lord. Your, your gospel is, a, it's a, the kingdom of heaven is beautiful, Lord. And you've come as the, the perfect example of the suffering servant, someone who, who doesn't shy away from injustice, but, but treats justice with compassion, uh, injustice with compassion, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would keep those, these thoughts in our hearts and our minds as we go throughout this week. We pray all this in your name.